What happens when galaxies collide? Galaxies are made mostly of stars and gas. But when galaxies collide, the stars and the gas do very different things. In a typical spiral galaxy, for example, there might be about 100 billion stars. But if two spiral galaxies collide, it's very unlikely that any of those stars will collide. That's because there's so much space between stars that the chances of a collision are, well, astronomical. But the gas in galaxies, that is a different story. The gas in a typical galaxy is spread out like clouds in our atmosphere. These vast clouds don't miss each other like stars do. Instead, they smash together with tremendous force. This force compresses the clouds and causes hydrogen atoms to clump together and form new stars. But galaxies colliding isn't just an orderly crossing of stars and the creation of new ones. Gravity plays a very large role in a collision. Much like the gravity of the moon causing tides on the Earth, during a collision, galaxies are stretched out in a process called tidal disruption, creating these dramatic tidal tails. Interacting galaxies may pass through each other many times before they finally settle down into a new, larger galaxy. In fact, our own Milky Way galaxy is interacting with a nearby Andromeda galaxy, and in about 3 billion years, they're going to start to merge too. For Ask an Astronomer, I'm Varjan Gorjan for NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. For an astronomer, stars and galaxies are easy to find in the sky. They're always at the same latitude and longitude. Asteroids, though, move across the sky at different rates. Asteroids are bits of rock left over from the formation of the solar system, and many of them have experienced collisions. This means that their orbits are not as easy to predict as those of planets. So the way we discover new ones is to observe a part of the sky for some time and to see what moves. We can do that by simply taking a series of images and lining them up so the background stars are in the same place and then flipping through the images. It's much easier to find asteroids in infrared light than in visible light because these objects are usually not very shiny. They don't reflect back very much sunlight. But just like a dark sunlit rock on the Earth, these objects glow in the infrared. Asteroids are dark and warm against the background of space, so they shine brightly in the infrared. Astronomers often make a series of observations of a particular asteroid to determine its size and shininess. Once you've observed an asteroid a few times, you can figure out how far away it is. You can also predict where it's going as well as where it's been. Learning all we can about asteroids adds to our understanding of the makeup of the solar system and how it got to be the way it is today. For Ask an Astronomer, I'm Badushi Bhattacharya at NASA's Infrared Processing and Analysis Center. stars. When we first look into the night sky, it seems like all the stars are glowing faintly white. But a closer look reveals that some are tinted blue or yellow or even orange. But why aren't there any green stars, or for that matter, purple ones? The answer to that actually has a lot more to do with how our eyes work than anything that's going on with the stars. Amazingly, all matter in the universe gives off light at every wavelength, from gamma rays to radio. But we give off a lot more of certain kinds of light based on our temperature. This is called black body radiation, and a graph of how much light comes at each temperature is called an object's black body curve. The black body curve peaks at different wavelengths depending on its temperature. Higher energy light has shorter wavelengths, so the higher an object's temperature, the shorter the wavelength light its black body curve peaks at. Cool objects like planets, brown dwarfs, even you and me, peak in infrared light. Hotter objects glow in visible light, and some objects, like the inner disks around black holes or gamma-ray bursters, are so hot that they actually shine in X-ray or gamma-ray light. But the human eye isn't a scientific instrument that precisely measures the wavelength of light entering it. We're a bit more organic. The normal human eye sees light with special cells on the retina called rods and cones. The cones are the ones that are sensitive to color. Each cone is sensitive to either red, blue, or green light. And the colors that we see are actually made up of a combination of these three primary colors. Our brain does the interpreting. 
but we're not actually sensitive to all the colors equally. We see green light a lot better because it also triggers a little bit of the red and the blue cones. And since cones are sensitive over a range of wavelengths, it's hard for us to know exactly what wavelengths we're looking at. So when we superimpose a black body curve on the range of light that we can see, you'll notice that a cooler star looks red because the leading edge of the black body curve is visible. A really hot star looks blue because the trailing edge of the black body curve shines more brightly on the blue end of the spectrum than on the red end. But if a star is exactly the right temperature to peak at the wavelength we see as green, well, the black body curve also triggers the red and the blue cone, so we kind of see it as white. In truth, our own sun peaks in the yellow-green part of the spectrum, but it doesn't look very green to us. And remember my question about purple stars? Well, the most massive stars in the universe are so hot that they actually peak in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. But our eyes are just not very sensitive to purple light, so these stars look more blue to us than anything else. And stars that really peak in the green basically look white. Realistically, stars come in every color. It's just that we don't see them that way because of a fluke of how our eyes evolved. For Ask an Astronomer, I'm Dr. Michelle Thaller at the Spitzer Science Center. Can a galaxy die? Like most things, the answer to the question of the death of galaxies depends on your definition. If you define dying as no longer existing in a form where we would look at it and still call it a galaxy, then yes, galaxies can die. One way this could happen is if a galaxy collides and merges with another galaxy. The original galaxy wouldn't be around anymore, so you could then say that the original galaxy died in the merger, even though there is a larger galaxy left over. But there is another way a galaxy could die. Galaxies are basically a large collection of stars. Stars are continually running out of fuel and dying. But in galaxies with enough raw material to make new stars, a young population of stars will replace the dying ones. However, if enough time passes and a galaxy converts all of its available gas into stars, and then the stars die out, at that point the galaxy would no longer exist in the form that we are familiar with. There would be almost no light generated by the galaxy, and it would be a combination of dust, black holes, cinders of white dwarfs, and neutron stars. Some intermittent light may be generated when some remaining wisp of gas not big enough to make a star falls onto a neutron star or a black hole, or from the rotation of a neutron star, which is called a pulsar. But pretty much, the galaxy would be dark in most wavelengths of light. This process would take many tens of billions of years. But it fits the definition where the galaxy no longer exists in a way that we would ever identify it as a galaxy, and hence, it would be dead. For Ask an Astronomer, I'm Varjan Gorgian for NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory.